This morning's first lesson is taken from Psalm 123. If you'd like to follow along in your pew Bibles, you may do so. It can be found in the Old Testament, page 572. Listen for the word of the Lord. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. As the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Have mercy upon us, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than its fill of the scorn of those who are at ease of the contempt of the proud. Our second lesson is taken from Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. And if you'd like to follow along in the Bible, you may do so in the New Testament at page 34. Listen for the further word of the Lord. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave! You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow, and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents, for to all those who have more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, Throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of the Lord. All right. Brothers and sisters, let us turn to God in prayer. Living God, with our eyes and with our minds, help us to see the truth. With our hearts, O oh God, help us to feel the truth. With our mouths, help us to speak the truth. And with our hands and our feet, help us to live the truth. We pray in the good name of Jesus Christ, who embodied your truth completely. In his name we pray. Amen. On this Pledge Dedication Sunday, when we are 
reflecting together on what it means for us to live grateful, courageous, generous lives in the context of this congregation, we are given today, Pam just read for us, a psalm and a parable. And I think that our parable this morning from Matthew, the more I have thought about it, the more I find it somewhat unsettling because I am not sure that its precise meaning is exactly obvious. I've been thinking about this all week, especially since our conversation on Wednesday morning in the Bible study. And I'm not sure about the identity of this parable, which is partly to be expected. Parables are not intended to be obvious. Parables are intended to provoke us to think deeply about God, our faith, and about the world. Jesus was an expert teacher, and expert teachers do not merely want their disciples to be able to parrot back information to their teacher on an exam. Good teachers want their disciples to be free thinkers. Jesus wants his disciples to be free moral agents in the world. So Jesus is more than willing to leave us a little unsettled about exactly what is going on. And as I've been thinking about this parable since our Wednesday Bible study, I've been continuing to wonder about the identity of the master in this parable, the one who hands out five talents and two talents and one talent to three of his slaves and a talent, you may have noticed in the footnote at the bottom of the scripture page, a talent represents approximately 15 years worth of wages. So this is a lot of money that's being doled out here. The master distributes these talents and then goes away and upon his return calls for an accounting of those talents. So who is this master? Does the master in the parable represent God, giving out gifts to God's people and then wanting us to use those gifts? Does the master represent Jesus himself? That is one reading, and it is the traditional reading of the parable. And it's the reading that I am primarily inclined to go. But I say primarily because that's not the only way to read the story. There's at least one other story, and then I was told after the 830 service that there is at least a, maybe a third and a fourth. So there are different ways to read this. Could the master, in fact, be a relatively straightforward presentation of a coercive, powerful property owner who would have been well known by the peasant population of ancient Palestine, who were Jesus' primary audience for his teachings? If you were to tell a story to a group of poor Palestinian peasants and it was a story about a massively wealthy property owner, we may imagine that those peasants would have had a couple of thoughts about that massively wealthy property owner, and they may have been at least a little skeptical about him. When the third slave tells the master, Oh, I knew you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you did not scatter seed and generally taking things that do not belong to you, we may notice that the master does not disagree with him. The master could have responded by saying, oh, no, 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 no. No, you've got the completely wrong idea about me. I'm so sorry that you think that way about me. L let me see, what can I do to restore and change your impression of me? But the master doesn't say that. Instead, the master takes the single talent from the third slave, gives it to the first one, who already had ten talents, and then has the third slave tossed out into the outer darkness where 
in what is a particularly Matthew way of speaking, where there is weeping and gnashing. And you kind of got to say it with that tone of voice. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Who is this guy? Now, some people, upon sitting with this parable, have said the master is not a god to whom we would be drawn, a God with whom we would gladly and joyfully fall in love. This God in the parable is a God of whom we should be scared. This God, according to folks who read it this way, would say this God does not square very easily with the God of mercy and generosity and love. Others who hew to a more traditional way of interpreting the parable, will counter this and say, look, this parable describes both God's overwhelming generosity with God's gifts and God's holiness. This is a God who will not be mocked, a God whose will is sovereign and whose purposes will be accomplished. If we do not like it, that's our problem, not God's problem. So you got at least two different ways of looking at this and probably some other ways. And what often happens, what happened a little bit in the Wednesday Bible study, although it was a pretty relaxed, tame conversation, other conversations I've been in are more heated, the sides will marshal their arguments and try to shout down the people on the other side. It's as though... We have come to Jesus, and we're wanting Jesus to give us a clear set of instructions about how to live. And in response, Jesus gives us a parable. A parable that leaves our heads kind of spinning. So that the church now, as then, can find itself a little bit perplexed. Here we are, we're just trying to do the right thing, trying to discern our way forward, trying to find out what's right. And our Savior gives us this thick parable that practically demands that we argue with each other about how to make sense of it. This is wonderful stuff. And this is a side note. This is why we, got in, we need the church. Because if I were to go off and just read this parable all on my own, what would happen is that I would say, oh, I know what that parable means. And I'd go merrily on my way. And then I run into you at the store. And we talk about it. And you're like, that's not the way I'm reading this. And I'd be like, well, what's the, what's the problem with you? So in the church, we can bring our different ways of seeing it to meet each other. Now, the character in the parable to whom our attention is drawn is the third slave. And I would say that's the case whether the master represents God or a more wicked property owner. The first two slaves, they do what the master expects, and frankly, they're not terribly interesting. They just go and they do what they're supposed to, and they take what the master's given them, and they use those gifts to make more. But the third slave goes off, digs a hole in the ground, and buries the money, and then when confronted about it, the third slave says, well, I know what kind of a guy you are, and you're harsh, and I was scared. Now, so we play this out. If we read the master as representing God, then what we see in the parable is a, is a what we see in the third slave is a failure to live courageously and vigorously. The third slave, if we read it this way, misunderstands God, for God only wants us to live without fear. Over and over and over and over we are told in the Bible, do not be afraid. God does not want us to be scared. This third slave, however, misunderstands God and fearfully assumes that the master is going to punish any failure to succeed. And so rather than taking risks... Rather than living boldly, this third slave lives a timid life in which he wants to play it safe. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I sure can identify with this third slave. In our world of division and pain and hostility and violence, there is a lot of work, a lot of work for the church to do. But doing that work and engaging in that mission may not bring automatic success. Just stepping out on the path does not guarantee that you're going to win. We may mess up. We may misunderstand things. We may fumble our way through. We may upset those who disagree with our ideas or our goals. And so a lot of the time it can be safer to keep our heads down <laughs> and bury our ideas and our energies and our beliefs. So on that reading of the parable, the third slave serves us as a warning of how not to live courageously. On the other hand, when we read the master as Wicked seems a little strong, but I'll just use it because it's a juicy word. When we read the, the master as being wicked, then the third slave appears very differently. In this view, the master is something like the head of a syndicate looking to enhance his own wealth by sending out his minions to bring home even more money. And so slaves one and two go out, they obey the master and they do what he wants, but the third slave knows that the master is a bad man. And so he engages in an act of resistance and he refuses to be an accomplice in his schemes and the man does that at the risk of punishment and banishment just as Jesus will be punished and banished just a few chapters later. The third slave lives courageously even though he probably knows it's going to cost him deeply. So on this reading, Jesus wants to be clear about the costs of discipleship. So the parable speaks deeply about living courageously and about the cost of living courageously, which raises the question for us, how is Lewinsville being called to live courageously? What talents are you being called to utilize in your mission as a congregation? How can Lewinsville be courageous and bold, taking risks with the talents that have been given to you and not hiding those talents in the ground because you don't want to rock the boat and you don't want to upset anybody and you don't want to make any waves. And on the other hand, are there ways that you as a congregation are being called to resist negative pressures in our community or in our culture? And it strikes me that Psalm 123, the first text that Pam read, may provide something of an interpretive key to knowing how to proceed with some degree of confidence. Psalm 123 is a psalm of humility and a psalm of trust. I raise my eyes to you, O Lord, you who are enthroned in the heavens. Our eyes are fixed on you. So the psalm speaks both personally about keeping your eyes on the Lord and collectively about keeping our minds on God. And as you read through the psalm, this psalmist knows very well about opposition and contempt from neighbors. The word contempt occurs a couple of times in the psalm. It's a short psalm, and two of the few words in that psalm are the word contempt. 
This psalmist knows what it means to have people look down on him. But in the midst of all of that opposition and difficulty, the psalmist stays focused on God, which is the source of the psalmist's humility. This is an exciting time in the life of this congregation. Your pastor nominating committee is doing good work searching for your next permanent and installed pastor. In the last month, you have engaged in new initiatives like the Trunk or Treat and the Churchwide Retreat, which have deepened your connections with each other and with your neighborhood, reaching out to show hospitality to your neighbors, no matter who they are, is an identified and articulated goal for this congregation. Your Faith and Public Policy Committee this afternoon is offering a training session to build your skills at listening to people who disagree with you. These efforts and a whole lot of other things are things that you are engaged in that are profoundly needed in our community and in our society. This is not just an exciting time to be part of this congregation. It is an important time to be involved in this congregation. Today we are inviting you to turn in your pledges of financial support for the mission and ministry of this congregation for the next year as you all work together to live out your faith with courage and with humility, always keeping your minds focused on God. To God and to God alone be all the glory. Amen. Amen. Friends, let us pray. Take us as we are, O oh God, individuals with different ways of perceiving reality, different ways of perceiving what should be done. Take us and blend us into your beautiful congregation in order that your purposes for this community, which require the efforts of every person in this room and beyond, that your purposes for this, congreg this community may be deepened, extended, and fulfilled. All of these things we pray in the reliable name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.